webinar titled Post-Tax Reform Strategy for Public Company Executive Compensation. Before I turn today's presentation over to our speakers, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's program will last approximately one hour, followed by a short question and answer session. We encourage you to submit written questions during the program. Please type your question into the Q&A widget on your screen. We will respond to written questions at the end of the program, time permitting. The webcast console you are looking at can be completely customized. You can resize or move any of the windows, including maximizing the PowerPoint presentation on your screen. If you experience technical difficulties, please visit the webcast help guide by clicking on the help widget below the presentation window. The PowerPoint slides are available for downloading on the resource list widget. The presentation will also be available on Foley.com in the next few days. Foley will apply for CLE credit after the webinar. To be eligible for CLE, you will need to answer the polling question during the program. For those of you seeking Kansas, New York, and New Jersey CLE credit, you are required to complete the attorney affirmation form in addition to answering the question that will appear during the program. Please email the form to khooven at foley.com immediately following the program. Please note certificates of attendance will be emailed to eligible participants approximately eight weeks after the webinar. With that, I would now like to turn the presentation over to our speakers. Thank you, Kayla, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I'm Kelsey O'Gorman, an associate in Foley & Lardner's Employee Benefits and Executive Compensation Group, and I'm going to be serving as the moderator for today's discussion. I'm pleased to be joined by two other members of our Employee Benefits and Executive Compensation Group, Lee Riley and Amy Seapluck, who both have a wealth of experience dealing with executive compensation matters and will be sharing their thoughts with us today about the changes to Code Section 162M and the impact of such changes on public company executive compensation. So before we dive in, here's a very brief overview of the topics we'll be discussing today. We're going to start with a summary of the old 162M rules, which is going to then tee up our discussion of the changes to Section 162M under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And finally, I'll have Lee and Amy share some of their practical advice regarding what public companies should be doing now in light of all of these changes. So with that, Amy, why don't you start us off by talking a little bit about how Section 162M used to work pre-tax reform. Thank you, Kelsey, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. As Kelsey indicated, I'm going to start with the refresher on the Code Section 162M rules prior to the changes to those rules under the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. This is what we'll refer to as the old law. This should help you appreciate the magnitude of the changes and set the stage for some of the upside that Lee will describe later. The new law is effective for fiscal years beginning on or after January 1, 2018, so some of you still have a bit of time under these old rules. So prior to the change in the law, under 162M, companies subject to those rules included only publicly traded companies, companies listed on NASDAQ or New York Stock Exchange, for example. Employees whose compensation was limited or potentially limited by application of 162M included only the CEO and a company's three highest compensated officers by pay other than the CFO, as reported in the company's summary compensation tables for SEC rules, and as employed on the last day of the company's taxable year. Note that due to the last day of the company's taxable year requirement under the old law, former employees were not considered covered employees. Once their employment ended, covered employee status ended. Also under the old law, a covered company's deduction was capped at $1 million per covered employee per fiscal year, and a big one, qualifying performance-based compensation did not count against that $1 million limit. And Amy, uh, this is Lee. I just wanted to point out uh, to everybody on the phone that during the course of this presentation, we're going to be talking generally about compensation paid 
during a fiscal year and saying, well, that compensation that's paid during the fiscal year, that is what's capped at a million dollar deduction limit. And we use that phrase because the general rule is when the compensation gets paid, the company gets a tax deduction. I do want to remind everybody, though, that that may not always be the case. There is a special rule that compensation paid early in the fiscal year that was earned in the prior fiscal year um, might be deductible in that prior fiscal year. Annual bonuses are a very good example of that. Annual bonuses paid within the first two and a half months of the year, but if all events that entitle that employee to that compensation were completed at the end of the prior year, that bonus is deductible in the prior year. So I just want to make that point because we've had some clients have a little confusion when they're thinking about their bonus that's going to be paid for 2017 and worrying that because it's being paid in 2018, it's subject to the new rules. That may not be the case. It might actually still be deductible back in 2017 under the old rules. Thank you, Lee. That's a great point. And you might hear us from time to time in the presentation using the term paid. And, you know, generally it is paid, but sometimes, as Lee pointed out, it's a deduction before it's actually paid. So turning back to the old rules and what I referred to as the big one under the old rules, um, elements of performance-based compensation. Most public companies made significant efforts to ensure that enough compensation qualified as performance-based to either avoid paying non-deductible compensation or to minimize the amount of non-deductible compensation paid. Um, the hoops that companies jumped through under the old law included ensuring that compensation was based on pre-established and objective performance goals. Um, classic example, your cash, annual cash bonus plan where bonuses might only be paid upon uh, attainment of pre-established goals. Um, some types of compensation qualify as performance-based even though they're um, or qualified, I should say, as performance-based, even though there might not have been um, specific performance goals layered on top of those. And the two classic examples are options and stock appreciation rights. They're inherently performance-based and generally um, automatically qualified as performance-based under old 162M. Um, the performance criteria and performance goals had to be set by a compensation committee made up of independent directors, had to be awarded pursuant to a shareholder approved plan, and could only be paid out following attainment of goals certified by the compensation committee. Thanks, Amy. Before we move on, would you mind running us through an example of how a public company's deduction calculation would have looked under these old 162M rules? Sure, Kelsey, I'd be happy to do that, and I just happen to have an example ready. Mm -hmm. So this is an example involving CEO compensation for a company's fiscal year ending December 31, 2017. If you happen to be a non-calendar year company, you, this example would apply to you for your fiscal year that ends in 2018. Um, we start in this example with all the compensation that a company would deduct in fiscal 2017 with respect to the CEO absent the 162M limits, and then we determine whether there is any compensation that qualifies as performance-based such that it is automatically deductible and doesn't need to be counted toward the $1 million limit. In this example, the performance incentive bonus is an annual performance-based bonus that is payable by March 15, 2018 to any eligible employee who was employed on December 20, 31, 2017. So this is that all events test that Lee mentioned. Um, this is, a, in my example, it's a situation where Everything that entitled that CEO to that bonus was complete on December 31, 2017. And so even though the bonus won't be paid until 2018, the company can deduct it in 2017. This example also involves taxable income from option exercise um, of $2.2 million to be exact. And as I previously mentioned, the options were consider, would be considered performance-based. 
So we start with this total compensation of just over $5 million. We're able to carve out of that $5 million plus $3,700,000, and that's the amount um, that's a performance-based cash bonus and due to option exercise. And so at the end, the, this company only has, for, for the CEO, just over $1.4 million of compensation that's subject to the $1 million deduction limit under old 162M rules. So in this example, at the end, the company loses just $415,000 of deduction on total compensation in excess of $5 million. Thanks, Amy. I always think that some concrete examples are helpful, and this was a good one, showing how the deduction calculation used to work under old 162M rules. So with that, Lee, would you mind taking us through the changes that were made to 162M? Yeah, absolutely. So there are going to be three changes that we're going to be talking about. Um, I do want to remind everybody that these changes apply to compensation deductions occurring in fiscal years starting on or after January 1, 2018. So for our non-calendar year companies, these new rules won't apply to you until your next fiscal year. I'll tell you what each of these three things means in more detail in a few moments, but as an overview, what the new law did was expand the companies who are subject to the rules, expands the number of employees who are going to be subject to the rules, and it eliminated the exemption for performance-based compensation. Now, the new law also gave us a transition rule for compensation paid in the future under what everyone is referring to as a grandfathered arrangement. And we'll spend a bit of detail later talking about what it means to have a grandfathered arrangement. So quick question for you guys before we move on. Clearly, these seem like some pretty big changes. Do you have any idea why Congress decided to do this? Um, yeah, this is a revenue raiser. Congress had to find ways to at least at least partially offset the lost tax revenue due to reduction in individual and corporate tax rates. Um, I believe this change is projected to result in additional tax revenues in excess of $9 billion over the next 10 years. So quite simply, it's a way for the government to make some money. Okay, so moving on to the first change. Um, is the definition of covered company. So as I said, the definition of covered company has expanded uh, to include not just our publicly traded securities, so people whose stock is traded on one of the stock exchange, but it also now ropes in companies that are required to file reports under Section 15D of the Exchange Act. So this would uh, pull in um, issuers of ADRs or companies with publicly traded debt. And I want to point out these are not voluntary filers. These are companies that are mandatorily required to file under that provision of the Exchange Act. The second change relates to who is considered a covered employee. So as Amy mentioned, under the old rules, covered employees were determined on a year-by-year -year basis. In any given fiscal year, you only were ever going to have four covered employees. Your CEO and your top three highest paid officers, never your CFO. Now, under our new rules, your covered employees, whose compensation then is going to be relevant for this issue, is your CEO, your CFO, so note CFOs are now in, and your top three highest compensated officers starting with fiscal years beginning after December 31, 2016. In other words, this is going to be cumulative, where you've got your starting list for calendar year companies. It's the people you're reporting essentially right now and the proxies you're preparing. And then you're going to add to that list as each year goes on. So, what we are referring to this rule as, once a covered employee, always a covered employee. This rule has an unfortunate result of pulling in compensation that is paid after an individual terminates employment. 
So remember that Amy explained under the old law that once somebody terminated employment, they stopped being a covered employee. So under the old law, anything you paid after termination of employment was always going to be fully deductible. Under our new rule, once a covered employee, always a covered employee, an individual retains that status even after termination and even up to and including after death so that payments made to a covered employee's beneficiaries would also be subject to this million dollar deduction limit. Lee, let me interrupt here um, real quick and ask another question. So, as you know, occasionally companies will have interim CEOs that only serve for a very small portion of the year, but as you also know, we would still have to report that person in our SEC tables. So are you saying that even though such interim CEOs are only, you know, CEOs for a very small portion of the year, that they're still going to always be a covered employee? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, again, this, this rule is focusing, you know, in part on CEOs and CFOs. If you're a CEO or a CFO for even one day, you become a covered employee forever, uh, even if you're, you know, later changed from that position. So the third and final change is the elimination of the performance-based compensation exception. And so this is pretty straightforward. We no longer have that awesome role that we used to have that as long as compensation qualified as performance-based, it would be fully deductible. Now all compensation payable in the future will count towards the million-dollar deduction limit unless that compensation is paid under a grandfathered arrangement. So, what is a grandfathered arrangement? Well, under the tax law, a grandfathered arrangement is defined as a written binding contract that was in effect on November 2, 2017, and that is not materially modified after that date. Lee, just to be clear, all we're saying is that the old 162M rules continue to apply with respect to grandfathered arrangements. Not that everything that was in place on November 2nd, 2017 is magically exempt, right? That's right. So all we're saying is if you've got one of these grandfathered arrangements, all those old rules will continue to apply when that compensation is paid. Okay. So it seems to me from this slide that there's kind of two important concepts under this grandfathering rule. One, what does it mean to be a written binding contract? And two, what does it mean for that contract to be materially modified? Um, that's exactly right, Kelsey. Now, unfortunately, we don't have guidance from the IRS yet about what those concepts mean. So at this point, the best we're able to do is make some educated guesses. Now, the good news is that when Congress added 162M to the code back in 1993, they actually had pretty much the exact same rule at that time. They said, if you had a written binding contract in effect in February of 1993, and as long as you don't materially modify it, compensation paid under that contract would not be subject to the, what was then the new 162M rules. We believe, suspect, that the IRS will probably adopt exactly the same or substantially similar rules to what existed in 1993. Assuming that is true, then an arrangement will lose grandfathering status as of the date it can be unilaterally amended or terminated by the company. In other words, the minute the company can get rid of an arrangement, it's not grandfathered. Um, another rule coming out of those prior guidance um, is that if a contract is up for renewal, it stops being grandfathered as of the date of the renewal if either the company or the employee can terminate it, or sorry, choose not to renew it, I should say. And of course, employment agreements are a very typical example of that. You have an employment agreement with a three-year term. They typically say, as we're approaching the three-year term, either party can choose to not renew. So it might be grandfathered now, but as we approach renewal date, or as of the renewal date, it would stop being grandfathered. And as far as material modifications, and again, keep in mind, the rule is that your grandfathered arrangements are no longer grandfathered if they're materially modified. The prior guidance has said a material modification occurs if there is an amendment to increase the compensation payable under that arrangement, 
or an amendment to accelerate or delay the payment. So, Lee, as you said, these are kind of our best guesses at this point as to what the grandfathering rules will look like. Do you guys have any idea about when we'll know for sure or get actual regulations? Well, Kelsey, that's a great question and one that doesn't have an answer. We think the IRS is likely already working on guidance because they know that grandfathering is going to be key here. Um, and we can probably expect guidance on this transition rule soon. In the past, with other situations involving grandfathered ar arrangements, the IRS has issued at least preliminary grandfathering guidance relatively quickly after a change in the law was enacted. And the other thing, as Lee mentioned, there are existing grandfathering rules under 162M from back in 1993 when it was created. And it seems to me at least that that might make things a little bit easier for the IRS in this context and allow them uh, to move quickly. But that remains to be seen. And mm -hmm. certainly when something comes out, we'll let you all know, likely via a client alert. Great. So keeping in mind that we don't know for sure what the regulations will look like, are there still things that companies should be doing now in light of the grandfathering rule? Yeah, we do think that companies should get started on this process sooner rather than later. And so the first thing you're going to want to do is to identify those written contracts that were in effect on November 2nd um, that call for payments. That could have been excludable under 162M. Again, the obvious ones are your stock option agreements or your performance awards like performance shares or performance restricted stock units. But also keep in mind that under the old 162M rules, compensation paid after termination of employment was also fully deductible. So we think grandfathered arrangements might include any arrangement any contract that would have provided for payment after termination, such as employment agreements or severance arrangements or deferred compensation plans or SERPs. Now, with that said, I just want to make sure it's clear to everybody that new compensation arrangements that you will enter into after November 2nd, such as your new equity awards, new bonus plans, new employment agreements, et cetera, are not likely to be grandfathered, and so all those new compensation arrangements would be subject to the $1 million deduction limit. Now, once you have this stack of contracts, the next thing you want to do is to go through and try to determine whether those payment obligations are binding. Uh, state law is probably going to be the relevant law to determine what's a binding contract. So some things you want to look for and kind of highlight as you're looking at your documents. Does my employer have the right to terminate this arrangement? If so, when? That's going to be critical to understanding grandfathering. Does the company have discretion to reduce or eliminate the payment? We see this very often in cash bonus plans. Cash bonus plans often say, you earn a bonus of 100% of your base salary if XYZ performance goals are met. Oh, except the committee in its discretion can choose to cut that payment in half or eliminate it altogether. We believe, although again, we're not entirely sure, that that type of discretion might cause that arrangement to not be grandfathered. You also want to pay attention for when that contract comes up for renewal because, as I said, as of that date, probably not grandfathered. Now, we want to point out a special thing you should think about on deferred compensation and SERP arrangements because for those, you might need to focus on what benefits have accrued as of November 2nd. That's because, in our experience, deferred comp, SERPs, you know, plans along those lines typically say the company can eliminate this plan on a go-forward basis whenever it wants, although they cannot touch or take away what's accrued to date. So if we are right about our educated guesses about what's grandfathered, under that type of plan, amounts accrued as of November 2nd, 2017, will be your grandfathered amounts. Anything accrued or earned after that date wouldn't be.
So this may necessitate working with your plan vendors and record keepers to figure out those amounts. So Lee, are these things that you're actually seeing your clients go through the process of doing now, or do you find that most companies are holding off until we receive additional guidance? We are definitely seeing clients um, work you know, either by themselves or with Foley's help to do this. Um, and it's, it's important because even though we don't have final rules yet, um, once we do get the guidance, and hopefully it will get issued soon, you kind of want to be ready to go. Your tax department at these employers are very anxious to understand the impact of these changes on the company's tax deductions. And so what you don't want to be if you're in the executive comp or your internal legal counsel is kind of like behind the eight ball, mm -hmm. right? And so when the guidance comes out, you want to be ready to go and get that final analysis done, but you've got to do all this preliminary work to get there. Thanks for that insight. I think people always really want to know what other companies are doing. So before we move away from our grandfathering discussion, do you have any other thoughts about things that people should be aware of? Um, absolutely. So we have a few open issues that we at this point aren't real confident about how this might play out when we get guidance. Um, first, there was some really odd language in the conference committee report that accompanied the, the final tax bill that said something like, if both parties can agree to terminate a contract, that it's maybe not grandfathered. Well, that's odd in our view because, as you guys may know, two parties to a contract can always choose to terminate it. And so if that language is interpreted literally, it would basically mean there's no grandfathering at all. So we're hoping that that was maybe some sloppy drafting in the conference committee arising out of being rushed or late night, and it doesn't mean what it says. But I did want to raise that for the audience, just to give you a heads up in case we see something really weird in the guidance. Yeah, this is one that had us for a few minutes scratching our heads, but we like to think that Congress wouldn't have given us a meaningless um, transition or grandfathering rule, so hopefully more to come on that, right. more positive to come on that. Right. Um, the other thing is our CFOs. So as we had previously discussed, CFOs had not been subject to 162M at all under the old rule, and that meant that everything you paid to your CFO, including base salary, was going to be fully deductible. So for your CFO, when you're gathering up these written binding contracts, I would gather everything up for your CFO. Even an employment agreement that guarantees base salary might give you a basis to grandfather that CFO's base salary going into the future, at least until the point that that employment agreement is up for renewal or it otherwise expires. Um, the other thing that we really aren't sure how this is going to play out is earnings on grandfathered amounts. So again, taking that deferred compensation plan example, if the balance of a deferred comp account as of November 2nd is grandfathered, what is the IRS going to do with their earnings on that account going forward? Are those also going to be grandfathered or are they going to be treated as brand new benefits subject to the million dollar limit? The other point I want to make is to be very careful about making changes to these grandfathered contracts. As we said, if you materially modify a grandfathered contract, you will blow the grandfathering. So um, unless there is an absolutely urgent need to change an existing contract, our strong recommendation is to hold off until we get guidance before you make any such change. Great. Thanks, Lee, for explaining the grandfathering rules. Let's circle back now to this concept of once a covered employee, always a covered employee. What should companies be thinking about in this regard? Amy? Thanks, Kelsey. Um, clearly a really big part of this, the changes under the new law, is the elimination of the performance-based compensation exception. Um, another significant part of the change is the expansion of the universe of covered employees whose compensation is now or soon will be subject to the $1 million limit on deductions. Not only will this have a financial cost to companies, 
but unfortunately it's going to create some additional administrative work for some of you. Um, and specifically the, the, the work, if you will, is going to be identifying the covered employees. So under this new once a covered employee, always a covered employee rule, you'll need to identify your company's top three for fiscal years beginning after December 31, 2016. And that is the start of your covered employee list, which will continue to run forever and ever until people on the list are no longer with us, deceased. Um, and of course, your CEO and CFO will always be on that list going forward too. So you need to keep this ongoing list of covered employees along with a list of their compensation arrangements. So this identification of the covered employees kind of goes hand in hand with identification of grandfathered arrangements. You want to know what you have that's out there and be keeping track of it, both to make sure that you maximize your deductions. If something's grandfathered, you're, you know, you're, car you're carving it out, your deduction isn't limited, and two, so that you don't inadvertently modify something and lose grandfathering. Also, you really want to think about controlling the covered employee group um, and specifically give thought to the impact of one-time payments or awards that could bump an employee into the top three for a single year. So if you have an officer who you know, is maybe your fourth or fifth in compensation, you know, nine times out of ten. But one year you might be thinking about something special for that individual, or maybe even more, a more likely example would be you're hiring someone new and you're thinking about paying a significant signing bonus. You want to think about the impact of bumping that person into your top three for one year. That means that person's in forever, and if that person is going to consistently have compensation in excess of a million dollars, your, your company is probably going to be losing a deduction, you know, for, for many years to come. Um, the other thing, as Kelsey and Lee mentioned earlier, um, under this once a covered employee, always a covered employee rule, think about the impact of naming an interim CEO or CFO. We realize that sometimes that's necessary, but you need to at least be aware that that person named to that interim position will be on the covered employee list forever. So Amy, you took us through a really great example earlier in the presentation regarding how the deduction limit worked under the old rules. Could you now run us through a similar example showing what would be deductible under these new rules? Sure, Kelsey. So this example, This example is very similar to my prior uh, fiscal year 2017 example. It involves a public company CEO, compensation just in excess of $5 million, and the same types or categories of compensation. The big difference here is that instead of looking for carve-outs for performance-based compensation, we're now looking for carve-outs for grandfathered compensation. This is fiscal year 2019, and we are fully in the new rules. So in this example, there is only one grandfathered arrangement, and those happen to be stock options that, were, that the company issued um, prior to November 2nd, 2017. Uh, this CEO exercised some of those grandfathered stock options in fiscal year 2019 to the tune of $1.6 million of taxable compensation. You'll see that in the same year, the CEO also exercised some non-grandfathered options, um, so they're not carved out in the grandfathered exclusion column. So with the carve-out for the grandfathered options, this CEO has just over $3.5 million of compensation that is subject to the $1 million limit. So we're taking total compensation, 
subtracting the grandfathered amount, and that leaves us with th just over $3.5 million. Um, the first $1 million of that is deductible, and so here the company loses a deduction for just over $2.5 million of compensation in fiscal year 2019. So Amy, just to remind everybody, in the first example that you showed us under the old rules, where we had this performance-based exclusion, only $415,000 was non-deductible by the company. And in this example, exact same compensation arrangements, over $2.5 million is non-deductible by the company. I mean, that's a really huge difference for companies. It is. You're right. And think, this is just one of the covered employees. So by 2019, who knows, a company might have seven covered employees or eight or maybe hopefully only five. But, but it's certainly possible that you'll have more than that and, and likely some non-deductible comp with respect to a number of them. But, you know, as we discussed earlier, this is a revenue raiser and this is a good good illustration of the additional tax revenue resulting from the change. Of course, the impact of the loss of deduction is at least minimized by the lower corporate tax rate that will be in effect, or now is in effect for most companies, um, but it still results in compensation that the company could have deducted in 2017 but can't deduct in 2019. I also have another example here, and I won't go through this one in quite as much detail as the prior examples. There's just a few significant items that I want to call out for you. First of all, this example involves a, a former CEO. Under the once covered, always covered rule, the 162M deduction limit applies to a company's payments to a former employee who was a covered employee during em employment. That former employee remains a covered employee until his or her death. You can see in this example there are significant grandfather deferred compensation plan payments. Um, so again, illustrating the um, importance of grandfathering, identifying it and preserving it. And because of that significant grandfathered amount, that reduces the impact of the new law, but the end result is still a loss of over $1.5 million of deduction. And prior to the new law, the company likely would have been able to deduct, um, if not all of this, almost all of this. Thanks, Amy. So at this time, I think Kayla is going to jump in to announce the CLE code for everybody interested in receiving CLE credit. Thank you, Kelsey. At this time, I'm going to read aloud the CLE code for this program. If you are in need of CLE credit today, please enter this five-digit code into the poll question on the screen after it is announced and press the Submit button. The code is P6N93. Again, P as in Penguin, 6N as in Nancy, 9-3. One more time, P6N9-3. Again, if you are seeking CLE credit for this session, please complete the polling question by entering the code that was just announced. The polling question will, will remain open briefly. As a reminder, for those seeking Kansas, New York, and CLE credit, in addition to the polling question, you will need to complete the attorney affirmation form and send it to khooven at foley.com immediately after the webinar. At this time, the poll is now closed. I would like to return the program to our speakers. Thanks, Kayla. So getting back to the presentation, um, just to sum up what we've just talked about, there seem to be three major changes, all of which appear to be uh, bad news for companies. First, the number of covered employees is going to increase. Former employees are going to remain covered employees, meaning that severance, cert benefits, and other payments that are made after termination of employment are no longer going to be exempt from the $1 million limit. And there's no more performance-based exclusion from the $1 million limit. So that begs the question, is there any good news in all of this for a company? Yes, we do have, a, we do have quite a, a big silver lining here. Um, as I am characterizing this, um, companies are getting 
released from the shackles of 162M, Amy made the point that our clients typically have tied themselves in knots, making sure their performance-based compensation was 162M compliant, and all the restrictions that were included in that concept. And now, going forward, we're not going to really have to worry about that anymore, which is pretty awesome. Um, so what are some of the great things coming out of this? So under the old 162M rules uh, for performance-based compensation to qualify, the performance goals needed to be objective goals, typically, you know, financial gap kind of performance measures. Um, now we can do subjective goals. And so, for example, if it's really critical to the companies uh, this year that their CEO create a succession plan, um, in the past we would have said, a good succession plan is not an objective performance goal. You can't use that for 162M. Now, going forward, help yourself and put that as a goal if that's really important to the company. Another example of a subjective goal and something that a number of our clients have wanted to use in the past and have decided not to because they didn't want to blow their performance-based compensation status is 360 degree performance reviews. Um, a lot of companies would like to take those types of evaluations into account in setting bonuses, for example, and now they can choose to do so. That's a great point. And, and again, you can weight these things too, right? So you could say 80% is a objective financial performance and then 20% some of these other subjective um, criteria. So it really opens up your compensation structure to that type of an arrangement. Um, another good thing is that um, the committee, the compensation committee, needed to be comprised of these independent directors, independent as defined in 162M. And many uh, companies would be doing, you know, annual evaluations and making their directors fill out annual checklists to, to try to confirm this independence. So we no longer will have to have a, an independent 162M for 162M purposes committee, although I want to remind everybody that there's other independence requirements for our compensation committees, like under the stock exchange listing requirements and for Section 16b3. So we won't get entirely away from independence, but the 162M part of the independence and those rules are no longer going to be relevant. Except, sorry to interrupt, uh, Lee, but real quick, as you pointed out before, some companies have performance awards that may be grandfathered and still subject to the old 162M rules. So these companies are still going to need a proper 162M committee, correct? That, that's right, and, and so we should make that clear. So to the extent you've got a grandfathered award, and remember one of the old requirements under 162M is that you had that proper 162M committee that would certify the level of achievement of the performance goal. That was the kind of the last requirement on the back end, we still might need that to kind of finish up our grandfathered arrangements. But typically, I'm thinking within the next one to two years, we'll kind of run out of those grandfathered performance goals. They'll all be certified, and then we won't need this, you know, specific type of committee any longer. Another good thing is ability to adjust performance-based compensation upwards. I would say the number one angst that my clients had under 162M was when they got to the end of the performance period, maybe something happened during the year or during the three-year performance period that nobody considered at the front end, and so we didn't build in an adjustment for that. So we're getting to the end of the performance period and the comp committee is going to sit down to certify the, the level of achievement of the goals and the goals just weren't hit because of this unexpected thing that happened. But yet we feel like we want to pay our executives. Maybe it wasn't their fault. They had, you know, they, they didn't control whatever that event was. And when clients would call us with those questions, we would universally say, oh, if you want this to be 162M compliant, you can't, you know, pay more than the goals would dictate. Now, yay, everybody, we can have as much upward discretion on our compensation as we like. The other thing to think about is what happens on severance. Um, if you look at your performance awards right now or employment agreements, they probably say 
if this executive is terminated from employment, he or she will still get the performance award, but only at the end of the performance period and only to the extent the performance goals are actually met. Those provisions were 162M driven because 162M said you cannot pay out performance-based comp other than actual achievement of the performance. So now if we wanted, we could redesign those awards for new awards going forward to say on termination of employment, you get paid out performance at target, uh, regardless of actual achievement, and that would be okay. So you theoretically under these new rules, could get rid of performance-based compensation altogether if you wanted and just go with straight base salary. That, interestingly, has been in the news recently as something that Netflix chose to do. Now, I will say Netflix had an unusual compensation program to start with. How they did their compensation was to determine an amount they wanted to give to their executives each year. So let's say the amount was $10 million. Um, and they would let their executives pick how to receive that money. I want it all as base salary, I want some as base salary, some as stock options or restricted stock units. But then they had a rule that if you wanted more than a million as base salary, that excess had to be performance-based. Obviously they did that and they said to their shareholders, the only reason we're doing that is for 162M deductibility. Well, now that 162M is gone for new compensation, they can kind of revert back to what they really would have liked to have done, which is let their executives take their entire pay and base salary if that's what they want. Now, we aren't advocating for this. Um, this falls into the camp of just because you can doesn't mean you should. Um, Companies, of course, will still want to utilize performance-based compensation. Um, first, if you're worried about ISS or other shareholder advisory firms, they kind of demand it. This is one of their critical criteria that they're looking at. Um, your shareholders are probably going to demand this. Shareholders like to see executives get paid based on good performance, and your business might want to continue this because it's really important to align your executive's actions with your strategy and your business plan and reward your executives when they execute on that. That's a really good point, Lee. Um, one other question, since you brought up ISS and sort of opened Pandora's box on this whole issue, do you foresee ISS changing how it scores equity plans or its CMP votes in response to these changes in 162M? I, that's a great question, and I don't think so. I mean, there, our reality in the past has been that ISS has frankly never paid attention to these 162M provisions in our, in our plans. So, for example, there is nothing on the ISS equity plan scorecard about uh, the individual limits, that they have to be below a certain threshold. Um, ISS never paid attention to performance goals in our plan. Um, they just didn't, you know, they understood that those rules were there for 162M deductibility, and so they just didn't really pay attention to them. So we'll see if the ISS changes any of its guidelines in the future, but at this point, I'm not seeing that any of these things will really matter to them. Um, and more on the silver lining, um, if you recall, if you had a 162M shareholder approved plan, every five years you needed to go back to your shareholders and get them to reapprove your performance goals and your individual award limits. Um, and now you won't have to do that any longer um, unless for some reason you need to continue to do that to maintain grandfathering status of existing awards. And kind of the last part of the silver lining, I would say, is that at least even though we're going to be losing a lot more tax deductions due to these new rules, it'll be at a 21% corporate tax rate, so it's, it'll be less of a hurt than it would have been had the old corporate tax rates remained in effect. Still a hurt, though. Still a hurt. Yeah, so I understand that the cost of the last deduction may not be as much given these lower tax rates, but... 
If a company wants to do more to try and minimize the impact of a loss deduction, what are you guys advising them to do? So there are a couple of strategies that we've thought about for maximizing deductions under the new law. And these strategies are exactly that, though. They're possibilities that companies should consider, but they might not be the right fit for every company. Um, probably the biggest strategy to think about at this time is spreading payments out over time. So what are some examples of that? Um, a company could amend an existing deferred compensation plan to only allow installment distributions of future accruals or to cap the amount that would be distributed annually under the plan at a certain dollar amount or at an amount that wouldn't trigger um, loss of deduction under 162M. With respect to equity awards that, you know, for example, um, tax are taxable when they vest, you might consider applying a longer vesting period, um, you know, vesting over five years, say, instead of three, so that the um, tax impact is spread out and therefore smaller each year. Similarly, a company could consider capping the amount of options or stock appreciation rights that a covered employee could exercise in a given year, you know, perhaps at a specific dollar value or again at an amount that wouldn't trigger a loss of deduction under 162M. Um, these are just some things that companies can think about and like I said, maybe not right for everyone. So. I appreciate that these things that you've been talking about, that they sound good in theory, but don't you guys agree that there's some real costs and consequences associated with doing some of these things? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we don't want to imply that tax deductions should drive necessarily these types of design decisions. Um, you want to look, for example, at the accounting consequences. You know, one of the, the things I've talked about with the client is their stock options. Um, Many stock options say that once you terminate employment, you've got 30 days to exercise or 60 days to exercise. That means going forward that when we have a covered employee that terminates employment, they are going to exercise all their stock options in that 30 or 60 day window. They don't really otherwise have a choice. That also means you have a boatload of compensation happening at that one point in time. If it's more than a million, you're going to lose your deduction. So maybe one strategy is to expand the time period after termination of employment that somebody could exercise their option. Maybe not 30 days, but maybe a year or three years or five years. Um, and that would allow that person to then delay their compensation into a future year where hopefully it's going to be deductible. But that kind of change is going to make that stock option more expensive from a financial statement accounting standpoint. And so maybe it's not worth it to do it. Um, you also obviously want to think about your audience, which is your executives. Some of these changes might be great for the company and might maximize the company's chance of a deduction, but is it going to meet your executive's cash need goals or investment goals or tax planning goals? And so all of those things have to be considered. Um, I think. Our only point is that we feel like everybody should be having these discussions and you should at least talk through these opportunities and if they're not right for the company, that's fine, but the discussion should be had. Thanks, Lee. Um, so we want to make sure we leave a few minutes for questions and we've had a few come in, um, but I will just go through a couple more items that I think um, will be helpful to you. Another strategy for maximizing deductions, and this is one we touched upon a little bit earlier, and that is controlling your company's top three officers by pay. Um, thinking about structuring payments so that executives aren't bumping into the top three for just one year or considering timing of taxation of equity awards and option or SAR exercises. And Lee, I think you had an example that was a little bit different where I'm talking about trying to keep people 
out of the top three, if you will. Um, so yeah, you had kind of the opposite recently, yeah, right? Yeah, so I was talking to a client recently, and they had two executives who were kind of neck and neck to be that number three um, that would get reported in the comp tables. And the you know, one of the guys is somebody that they think probably will, won't ever show up again in the future. So what they're going to do is pay a bonus to the guy that they think is most likely to be there in future tables to make sure he's one of the top three. Because, um, again, we think he's going to be in the top three next year and probably the year after that. And so, you know, you had talked about making, you know, structuring payments to keep somebody out, but you can also theoretically pay money to keep somebody in, especially if they've already been in in the past, um, and that extra compensation might be well worth it if it's going to save you, you know, a loss of deduction on a fourth, the fourth person. Interesting. So before we wrap up, are there any final things companies should be thinking about right now? There are just a, two quick additional items to think about. One, review your equity plan and analyze whether there are 162M provisions in there that are now needlessly restrictive. You don't want to be shackled to 162M, as Lee said, um, if it's not necessary. So are there award limits or performance goal requirements that don't make sense for your company that are having a practical impact? Um, it may be that some of these provisions are in there, but they really have no practical impact. And if that's the case, then you probably hold off on revisions until the next time you're otherwise revisiting your plan. The other thing, educate your compensation committee and impacted executives. Chances are that most of you are going to be thinking about changes to your compensation structure, if not this year, because perhaps it's too late already for this year, but certainly for future years, and you want your compensation committee and impacted executives to understand what's driving the changes you're considering or implementing. And then one last final point that I've been thinking about, too, is severance for departing executives. So again, let's say we've got an executive who is exiting the company, we're negotiating severance, maybe there's, there has not been a pre-existing contract. Um, I'm thinking we don't want to pay that severance in a lump sum ever again if we can help it. Ideally, that severance gets paid out over a couple years or even three years because, again, it's the million dollar deduction limit per year. And so I don't want that huge severance payment happening at one time. Max, you know, losing a big deduction, let's spread that out. So keep that in mind as a strategy to think about as executives are terminating. That's a great point. So I think it, we have just a few minutes um, left in the presentation. So I'm going to turn it over to Lee, who's going to answer a few audience questions. Yep. So one question says, if a company has a long-term incentive plan covering a three-year performance period, that was adopted prior to November 2nd, 2017, then I assume all amounts paid out under that plan would be grandfathered. So the answer to that is, in general, yes, provided a couple things. Number one, um, there is nothing in that plan that says the company can terminate the plan unilaterally and just wipe out the compensation. If the plan has that type of provision in it, probably not going to be grandfathered because the employees don't really have a written binding contract to the payment. Also, keep in mind that um, at the end of the performance period, we still need to sort of complete our 162M actions. We need our compensation committee comprised of independent directors to certify the level of achievement of the goal. But assuming those couple of things are met, then highly likely to be grandfathered. This um, listener also asked a question about why all CFO comp might be deductible. That's a great question, and again, I want to emphasize, we think this is how the grandfathering rules are going to play out, although we're not 100% certain, so this is one of these wait and see. But the reason we focused on that is under the old 162M rules, a CFO was never a covered employee. So under our old rules, all compensation paid to your CFO was always fully deductible. Therefore, we think under the grandfathering rules that all compensation paid under a grandfathered arrangement to a CFO should remain fully deductible. 
And again, we'll wait and see, but we believe that is how these rules should be read. And then we have one final question, um, which is, what about an affiliate uh, of a public entity, and would that company always be subject to these rules? And so I think what the uh, questioner is getting at is, let's say we have a subsidiary of a publicly traded company. If that, and that subsidiary happens to employ one of these covered employees, if that subsidiary gets sold um, or becomes a, an entity that's unrelated to the public company, is the rule, once a covered employee, always a covered employee, going to kind of follow that subsidiary? And the answer to that should be no. So compensation has to be paid in the context of a public company somewhere up the chain. So if you have a subsidiary and that subsidiary ends up not being part of any public company control group, then the subsidiary at the point it's no longer part of the public company group is not going to be subject to these rules. Um, we are running out of time, so we know we had a few more questions than we were able to address, and we will get back to the questioners via email to answer your questions. Great. Thanks, Lee. And thanks again to everybody for joining us today. So at the end of this webinar, a short survey is going to appear on your screen. If you wouldn't mind just taking a few minutes to fill it out, we would greatly appreciate it as your feedback helps us shape our future webinar programs. So thanks again, everybody, and we hope that you all have a great rest of your Tuesday. Thank you.